Okay. So uh, joining Greg Johnson, who preached at Refuge on Sunday, a wonderful sermon. Uh, I still, I'm trying to go to Bank of America and see if that actually your illustration works. And as of yet, it's a better portrayal of the gospel than it is of Bank of America. But uh, <laughs> yeah, they dropped um, me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, it was uh, a wonderful, wonderful sermon on the uh, not just is Christianity homophobic, but what is really what is the heartbeat of of the gospel for for everyone? Um, and how does it level the playing field? So uh, Greg is uh has agreed to come on and address some of the follow-up questions that certainly would come from a from a, a sermon uh, on sexuality in any capacity. But um, so I'm grateful that you uh, were willing to do this and carved out some time. And um, so we'll we'll start with uh, I think uh, there were there were a couple of different questions. Um, that revolved around uh, the Bible's view of homosexuality or our view of the Bible's view of homosexuality. And um, is this misunderstood in our day? How does the Bible, uh, do you, are you convicted that the Bible gives a clear definition of sexuality and what is, uh, what is prohibited, what is allowed? Um, and how do you make that argument from scripture? Yeah, it's a good question because there have been a lot of kind of revisionist work done um, by, you know, James Brownson and Karen Keene uh, are the two most recent publishing with Erdman's who have made an affirming argument for same-sex coupling. Uh, and uh, that argument largely goes along certain lines. Um, uh, they'll, like Brownson, for example, will argue that the creation narrative in Genesis 2 is is not about the man and the woman being complementary to one another, but about their being alike over against all the animals that have just been named. And uh, that will kind of open a door for, maybe it's not important that it's a male and a female, but just two people who are alike. Um, they'll then, um, you know, uh, argue from a, an argument of cultural distance that basically says that what was prohibited in the Old Testament, the homosexuality that existed both in, in St. Paul's age and in, in the ancient Near East was primarily either temple prostitution or male prostitution or, um, you know, the, I guess temple sex and pedophilia and, and basically inherently abusive forms of sexual behavior in which the, you know, uh, privileged partner is dominant and the, you know, passive partner is not, um, is the underprivileged. And, uh, and then kind of end up then relativizing all of the, the, the six or seven key passages in the Bible that, that address specifically homosexuality. And so that's kind of the, the direction that argument goes. Brownson also uses a, uh, what he calls a, uh, I can't remember what he calls it, but it's, it's a, uh, a canonical trajectory to argue that the Old Testament is primarily about um, uh, um, external holiness and the New Testament is primarily about internal holiness and he uses that to make a trajectory saying since the canonical trajectory is from externals to internals then we can surmise going forward that the next point on the trajectory is that it doesn't really matter so much who your partner is so much as that you have mutuality and love and respect and ex exclusivity and all kinds of things that we would look for in a heterosexual marriage. Um, and, uh, and I don't find those arguments very convincing. Um, when I look at the creation narrative, because the Bible, it's, you know, you can look at each and every individual text that talks about homosexual practice mm -hmm. and and you can try to pick apart or relativize or construct a context in which they're not saying what it seems like we're saying, thinking they're saying. You could, and you can do that with any passage of the Bible. But what we've got in the Bible is actually a larger narrative about sexuality, a story. And it starts in, in Genesis 2, where God creates the man, and then, he cre and then there's this search for a helper according to his complement. And he looks at all the animals, and there's no helper according to his complement. 
and and uh, it's a ezer kenegdo in in the Hebrew, uh, a helper, which is usually um, most of the use of that term is actually of God as helper. Uh, you know, the stronger party is not the one giving the help, but the one needing the help. So mm. it's not a sexist thing, mm. but uh, a helper, according to his complement, is not found. And so then God creates the woman, which is not ish, but isha, a different thing, like, but different. And he says, this is the one, bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman, because uh, she's taken out a man. And, and then the man and the woman are naked. And then, you know, at the end of chapter, I guess it's getting into chapter four or five, they, um, Adam lays with his wife, he knows his wife, and she conceives and bears a child. And so you've got the emphasis on their nudity. And it says that at the end of chapter three, it explains what this passage is about. It says, this is why a man will leave his father and mother and cling mm. to his wife and the two shall be one flesh. Mm. This, is, this is God's design that, that there is a diversity, that through a diversity of humanity, male and female, equal and opposite, yin and yang, coming together, they become co-creators with God of new human lives. And it's the reproductive system and the nudity and the laying down and the having a child. And, and what I find personally convicting, because I've never wanted to be with a woman, <laughs> uh, is, is that that vision of sexuality committed monogamous, diverse sexes toward procreation is always praised in the Bible. It's never spoken ill of. And, and St. Paul even warns husbands and wives to not uh, give up sex except for a season mm. to be devoted to prayer and then quickly come back so that you won't face temptation, which, relatively speaking. Um, and, and so, you know, it's all about keeping the marriage bed pure. And, uh, and yet every other form of sexual expression mentioned in the Hebrew or Greek scriptures is treated as a negative thing. Uh, whether that's sex before marriage, whether that is adultery within marriage, whether that is um, sex with an animal, sex with somebody of the same sex. And, uh, and so like, if you wanted to just take, um, if you wanted to just take, say, the Leviticus, the two passages in Leviticus that, that say, you know, that prohibit a man lying down with another man, uh, and you wanted to take that and say, that's all, if that was all the Bible said about homosexuality, then I could look at that and maybe say, well, you know, is that moral law or is that ceremonial law to be separate from the nations? And maybe it would be ceremonial law, like getting tattoos or having, you know, cotton polyester blends. Um, but, um, but it's not just those two passages, you know, you then get into Romans one where Paul specifically talks about women abandoning the natural relationship with women or with men to be with other women. He talks about um, men uh, sleeping with other men and, uh, and it's, it's treated as a negative thing. In fact, he uses it as sort of a gotcha moment because mm -hmm. the, 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 the Roman moralists and, and the, the Jewish you know, Pharisees would have all agreed that this is an abomination. And, uh, uh, you know, that, 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 you know, it was tolerated in, in Greece among mighty classes, but it was, was not Roman moralists or for, you know, they would have, they would have, and they would have all agreed that, that women having sex with women is an abomination. Nobody thought that was okay, except, you know, except the people doing it. Um, but, um, you know, so you've got this, this Paul speaking into this context and, 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 you know, everybody's saying, yeah, that's disgusting what those people do. And then he says, and you're no different. And then he lists mm. 31 other sins that are all mostly the sins of religious people. Things like gossip, bitterness, envy, divisiveness. I mean, we're pastors. We know all about the sins of religious people. And, and you know, the fact of the matter is bitterness and critical spirit and gossip will destroy your church faster than anybody fornicating. Uh, not that you want them having sex outside of marriage. But that's also sin. Um, when I look at that, you know, there are a couple other passages. There's, there's the first Corinthians six with Arsenokoite and, and Malakoi, which most scholars agree are, are in that context is likely referencing the, the active and passive partner in a homosexual relationship, whether of whatever nature that relationship is. Um, 
And then there's the passage, the one that I find most compelling is actually um, Paul's other one, the Timothy passage, um, 1 Timothy 1, 8 to 10, because this one, he is very clearly listing, he's got a list of sins, and he's listing them in order of the Ten Commandments, which uh, to me is just fascinating. And most American readers don't pick up on it because we don't memorize the Ten Commandments anymore. Mm. But, um, but, you know, he talks about, uh, it's usually translated, practicing homosexuality or sin of poitai. Um, but, you know, he says, we know that the law is good if one uses it properly. We also know that the law, that's God's moral law, is made not for the righteous, but for lawbreakers and rebels. He goes on, um, talks about uh, for, um, for the unholy and irreligious, um, which uh, would be irreligious, would be violating the Sabbath in a Jewish context. That's the fourth commandment. And then he says, for those who, who kill their fathers or mothers, the fifth commandment was honoring your father and mother. And he says, for murderers, that was the sixth commandment. Then the seventh commandment is the adultery, sexuality one. It says, for the sexually immoral, for our sin of poitai, those practicing homosexuality. And then he goes, the, the next commandment is, of course, don't steal. And he talks then about slave traders. And the actual Greek is man stealing, because that was the most egregious form of theft. And then liars, that's the next commandment about, um, you know, uh, 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 not testifying falsely in a court of law mm. uh, and perjurers. And uh, so he's, he's he's listing the Ten Commandments in order. Yeah. And having sex with men and um, adultery um, are are you know this are sexual immorality and homosexual practice. So that would be sex before marriage, typically though it can have a broader sense and sex with another man. And so I look at that, and it's very clear that Paul is viewing that practice as being prohibited by the Ten Commandments, which is universal moral law, not ceremonial or civil law in the Mosaic Code. Even the term he uses, arsenokoitai, is the Greek word for uh, arsenos is man and, and koitain is, is bed. And that's taken from the Septuagint of the Levitic, two Leviticus texts where it says, uh, a man shall not lie with a man as one lies with a woman. The, the, the actual, uh, in the actual Septuagint, which is the first century BC Greek translation that, that Paul often used himself. Uh, it's arsenos koitain, uh, man bed. And that's where the term arsenokoite came from is it was just lifting the text of the Septuagint uh, text of, of Leviticus to create a word that, that described that. Hmm. And, uh, and there was a lot of, you know, the, the dominant form of homosexual practice in the Greek world was definitely pederasty, which was sex with a, a teenager or young man. Um, Greek men did not marry until 30 and uh, on, on average, and they typically married a, a woman who was 14 or 15, you know, half their age, because the man had to earn a living first before hmm. he could have a family. And so, you know, if you think puberty is at 12 and you get married at 30, that's 18 years in a pagan context to explore. Uh, uh, with no Christian moral norm as established. And it was very common for teenagers, uh, teenage boys to, um, to pursue uh, and be pursued by 20 something men. Uh, and in fact, the same person could be the, um, you know, the pederastic lover, the young man uh, in his, in his, when he's 16, 18, and then when he's 25, he could be the older guy seeking him out. And then at 30, he's marrying and having kids and leaving all that behind. That's just, that was the Hellenistic way. Um, really the whole Greek speaking East, as far as the border of the Parthian empire. And there were, but there were also mutual same sex couples. Um, you know, the emperor Nero, he, uh, Paul would have been in Rome in 60, 64 AD when, um, when Nero married his first husband. And what's interesting there is Nero was the passive partner. N Nero wore the bridal veil, the nuptial torches, everything there. And yeah. so here you had the most powerful man on the planet who was not insane. He was an evil guy, but he was not crazy. That's, that's later historians threw that on him. But um, he fell in love five times. He married 
six times. The first was a political wife who he despised and probably killed, I think. But then the other five were two men and three women, and he fell in love with all of them. And uh, the first husband he had was, um, he was the passive partner, though he was the most powerful man on earth. Hmm. Um, so it's, it's, these things happen. There was, um, you know, others, um, oh gosh, I'm drawing blanks on names, but there's several mentioned just in Plato's Symposium. Hmm. Um, Agathon and, uh, uh, drawing a blank on the name, but um, yeah, there's the lifelong couple, gay couple of, uh, Pausanias and Agathon, uh, that's it. In, in, and they're together over decades because the one follows the other when he's hired to do work for the King of Macedon. Um, and, uh, and yeah, there's, you know, all these stories about, you know, in, in, so in the symposium actually at one part, um, there's a discussion of, of how homosexuality and heterosexuality originated. And the story that's told in Plato's symposium at this point is that originally human beings had four arms and four legs and two faces and the faces faced opposite directions. And, and they were so powerful that they threatened the gods and declared war on the gods. And so Zeus to punish these, you know, powerful humans split them all in half. So mm. that then you just had one face and two arms and two legs. And the ones that had been one male face and one female face, were split apart and they became heterosexuals because then they were always looking for their other half. They're, they're, they're the male looking for the female, the female for the male. Okay. While the ones that were, um, had been two males, when they were split apart, uh, they then became homosexual and began looking for other men. And, uh, and in the symposium, he actually explicitly discusses how every now and then they won't just find another man, but they'll find their actual other half. And those are the ones who live their entire lives together with no interest in women. And he stresses it's as emotional as sexual. Um, and then the ones that were two women split apart then prefer the company of other women and which would have been kind of the punchline of the story, I think, because they, they wouldn't have approved of that. But, uh, yeah. but they definitely had a concept of sexual orientation in antiquity or at least something close to it. And, uh, and so there were mutual couples and I think Paul would have known about this. Um, and in fact, that term arsenokoitai, um, uh, during Paul's own lifetime, um, uh, Philo of Alexandria, the Jewish philosopher during Paul's lifetime, uh, warned and lamented that, that, you know, had the, had the, um, barbarians joined in with the Greeks in their homosexuality, then our cities would have become empty and desolate because of all the men, you know, coupling <laughs> up with other men. There you go. And culturally that was okay. Um, yeah. 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 So I think when Paul talks about, you know, and he does it in, in three passages, um, I think he's just talking about generally men having sex with men. Uh, you're not, you know, you're not talking about, um, you know, like with malakoi, which is the word for soft, and it was used for the passive partner. You know, in First Corinthians six, when Paul says, "You know, do not be deceived. Malakoi will not enter the kingdom of heaven." Some people say, "Oh, well, that's that's you know, that's pedophile victims." But uh, but Paul would not have said being a victim of a pedophile mm. would would send you to hell. You know, that's, that's not a morally culpable thing to be victimized. You know, these are people yeah. actually choosing certain practice that, uh, that seems natural and right to them, but which leads to destruction. So yeah. that's a little bit, um, I've got three, two, two chapters in my book in which I kind of lay out all of that. Okay. Biblical, and biblical argument. Okay. Um, so what I, so and I kind of want to throw all these questions out because now I've got so many other ones. This I was fascinating. I, I love hearing it hearing all of that. Um, and, and it seems biblically, it seems that the Christian view of sexuality would also upend a heterosexual view of, of oppressor and right. But it, it, it's really kind of stands alone amongst ancient religions as one that gives value to the woman, even in a heterosexual relationship. I mean, is that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the, in, in antiquity, sex always had a, a power differential. Right. Um, 
And, you, you know, and, and some affirming our arguments or some affirming authors argue that because most homosexual practice in antiquity had a power differential between okay. you know, the client and the call boy or the temple prostitute and the person okay. worshiping the worshiper or between the older partner and the younger partner, that because of that power differential, uh, that's what was wrong with, with sex. That's why Paul prohibited homosexuality. But that power differential doesn't exist in modern gay relationships, which often it just does not. That's a given point. But the problem with that argument is that that would also prohibit all sexual activity in antiquity because there was a power differential between men and women. In Absolutely. That Absolutely. was probably stronger than the power differential between the 18-year-old and 25-year-old guy. Right. Uh, you know, because, and, 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 you know, the, but the ancients, they viewed sex as, as um, all about self-fulfillment self and power. Hmm. And the Christians were the ones who brought a new doctrine that it's actually all about self-giving love. It's not about self-expression. It's not about personal pleasure. It's about serving and loving someone else as Christ died for the church and, mm. and loves and cares for her. Mm. And, uh, and that elevated, of course, I mean, the Christians were the feminists of antiquity uh, in that they, uh, they, they had a very high view of women. Um, I mean, Junius is even called an apostle in you know Romans 16 or-, or, or Yeah. We think that's that was John Chrysostom's understanding of the text. Yeah, um, so yeah, I saw it's, that it's, uh, quote the other day by by yeah. Anyway, yeah, it's so I, fascinating. But yeah, you know, but and the thing about it that I always want to say, uh, you know, because I can say, okay, all of my homoerotic longing and desire, it's it's all bent, it's all crooked, but but the same is true of m the majority of heterosexual desire on the planet. Uh, I mean, if this is, the, yeah, because because of the the, the 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 polygamy or polyamory of the soul, you know, the lack of exclusive cultivation of sexual longing, and so uh, yeah. so it's like I can say, okay, yeah, one hundred percent of mine's probably drenched in sin, but probably ninety five percent of yours is. So you know, I mean, well, yeah, if this is the time for confession, and I think my wife knows this, she's upstairs right now. I will confess that I have not had sexual desire for one woman, one lifetime, like. Yeah, that's uh, we're all in the same boat. Absolutely, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Um, and so with that, and 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 I love not just because I'm I'm a huge proponent of understanding scripture in its context. And it's easy if we look back and say, well, this was just cultural. But we we have to understand what made this cultural. What made you know Paul in First Corinthians? They were all over the place. And I don't I don't think that anybody really saw temple prostitution as bad. And then Paul's like, no. <laughs> that's that's not like that daily practice there that is still um yeah and 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 paul did have to tell them all to quit sleeping with each other you know right. that should not or surprise us because that's what we have to do in our context because most dating couples are going to be sexually active unless we tell them not to right and uh cool. and as nt Wright talks about historically followers of jesus the historical testimony of followers of jesus you had people from every every uh, I don't, I don't know the, the right word, but every sexual background, um, that began at least starting to live out this new sexual ethic that was not common in ancient Greece. That was not common in ancient Rome. That was not that it began a new sexual ethic that was more than just appetite, more than just, as you described an issue of power or pleasure or any of those things. Um, so that I, I appreciate not just the biblical background, but also historical background. That's fantastic. Um, and, and okay, with that, uh, this, this isn't necessarily a question that came up, but it is something that, that I, I want to, uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts on uh, as far as um, orientation. So you talk about you know, in, in ancient Greece, which uh, I realize the whole sexual ethic was different, but in ancient Greece, uh, a man would in his in his twenties or whenever he, whenever the coming of age would look for a younger man, and then when he turned thirty, would marry a woman and leave that all behind. You know, or or whatever. Uh, as far as like orientation, um, your thoughts on. People being born a certain way, people it it uh, happening from, you know, a, a traumatic event in in childhood, 
what are your, and that, that's not an agenda question. Cause I, I am, I sit at that and go, I don't know. Uh, I'm where I default <laughs> on that is I go, I'm still good with the, I'm still good with the grace and mercy of Jesus, as you described on Sunday, yeah. that is for anyone and everyone. Um, but uh, yeah, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I have a section of the book on this too, uh, where I just went through kind of the current state of research, because about half of Americans would say you're definitely born gay. Um, and that number's increasing. And that was a view that was, um, that was Francis Schaeffer's view. He thought some people were born gay. Okay. Um, that was Billy Graham's view and John Stotts as well, at okay. least with some qualifications. And so that there is a Christian pedigree for that view. And, and Al Mohler, who nobody would consider a liberal, has said that if, if, ever, a, uh, if ever a biological cause for homosexuality is, is, is found, Christians should be the least surprised because we believe our biology has fallen. And so- um, Mohler said that. Al Mohler said that, yeah, in a, in a blog uh, or, uh, that, that I, I, I footnote heavily. Um, <laughs> Folded, underlined, italicized. Yeah, um, where the research is right now um, suggests, like if you look at twin studies and the biggest is the Swedish twin registry because the Swedes as a socialized system, they study everybody and they can just pull. And so they have the ability just to pull the medical records of every homosexual, you know, homosexually oriented person and uh and they do a twin study uh regularly and the swedish twin registry has found that if if and these are identical twins share the same womb um if if one is gay in orientation and when i say gay i'm just talking orientation i'm not speaking lifestyle i'm using it in its post 1990s meaning not its 1980s meaning um, okay and i want to hit uh, on that in just a second too but that's i'm grateful so, for the clarification yeah since 1990 or so it's been considered inappropriate to use homosexual as a noun because of its clinical and legal background and its 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 history in um uh, uh criminology um it's it's considered offensive to most and so there's okay. always been that question of well in which of the loaded terms do you choose to use and how do you explain it away but but in terms of the research if, if one twin was gay the other the, the identical twin had a, about a 30 percent chance 33 percent chance of also being gay uh which suggests it's one third genetic or and or intrauterine um and uh that that lines up with some of the assumptions going into a study that came out a few years ago that found five specific places on the genome that seem to account for a decent percentage of that, uh, okay. a plurality of that. Um, there are um, epigenetic factors. Um, epigenetic is relates not to the genes themselves, but to various processes chemically that happen on a gene that, that causes it to function differently. And uh, one study found a certain set of, of locations in which uh, a methylation process, epigenetic process uh, accounted within their study, they could account for homosexuality at 90%, but that could not be generalized to everyone else. That's just within that study. So it's not clear how much value it has, except there's clearly something going on there. One study was able to isolate 9% of homoerotic longing was connected to abuse in childhood. Hmm. Um, and I don't know, I, I think there was a lot of teaching on sexuality in the 1980s and 90s that assumed a much higher percentage to the point where I know a lot of um, gay women who are afraid to tell people in their church that they were sexually abused as a child because they don't want somebody saying, oh, that's why you're a lesbian. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, okay. Because that, they get that. It you know, becomes so an easy qualification. Five. Yeah. And so, but um, about Can 9%, I... and that's not clear if that's all of the story 9% of the time or half of the story 18% of the time or 36% of the time, a quarter. I have no idea. Yeah. Um, but there are all these factors. Um, the one, one consistent thing that's been found is is the um, the younger brother research that shows with each 
male child a woman bears, the, each, each successive male has a uh, male brother has a higher likelihood of becoming gay than the previous. Huh. And, and if you have enough of them, eventually you're gonna be the gay one. Um, and the theory is that it's um, in utero during the birth process, the mother's immune system attacking the androgens or sometime in utero attacking the androgens in the fetus um, somehow. And, and the, first, the first son primes the pump for that immune response and then each one makes it a larger immune response but again these huh. are all theories hypotheses right. and all together they maybe tell half the story and you know i would say genetics and epigenetics get us about a halfway there and then some of these other things might be factors and and there does seem to be difference between men and women um for example some of these twin studies found that with male homosexuals their shared environment accounted for 0% of sexual orientation. It was just not a factor. Hmm. Uh, while with, um, with males, with females, it was a much bigger factor. And that, and, you know, it's, and so that may explain, you know, Lisa Diamond's done a bunch of research. She's not a Christian on, on sexual fluidity and, uh, and particularly in women, um, women on average have a much greater level of sexual fluidity than men do. And you even see that in, you know, the high school studies that have mm. surveys that have been done of American high school students, where in the last several years, um, the, the number of women who identify as um, lesbian has been about the same, but the number that identify as bisexual has gone through the roof to the point where now about 20 to 25% of high school girls identify as gay, lesbian, bisexual, or unsure, while probably less than 10% of boys do. And uh, hmm. there is that old, that there is that old adage, um, bisexual till graduation. So that may just be that thing going on, but it's certainly, um, there's a higher level of fluidity hmm. with women than with men. Fa that's fascinating. That's fascinating. <clears throat> um, so my uh, answer is I don't know with a lot of things. <laughs> Good. That's that's encouraging. Well, yeah, and that uh, as, as followers of Jesus, and and here I am going to reference Al Mohler in a positive way. Uh, as followers of Jesus, we ought to be able to look at that and go, maybe, uh, and maybe not. Either way, not necessarily the point, um, yeah, or not you know, necessarily. I yeah, I think with somebody who's exclusively same-sex attracted they're going to be exclusively same-sex attracted more than likely their entire life. If, if they may develop what's sometimes called heterosexual functioning, which is the ability to be sexually drawn to one woman. Okay. That is an ability that is not generalized <clears throat> for women. They are, they're generalized. These are men who generally are drawn to men. Yeah. But uh, may through emotional connection have a, a, a sexual desire for one woman who they could then marry and actually uh, have a mixed orientation marriage. But uh, it's just a minority that, that experienced that. Most sure. of us, if it's exclusive, it's it's not going to change. Yeah. Um, all right, this one, <clears throat> and this is this is in some ways kind of a follow up on that, and then and then, uh, and and probably be best to keep this under four hours not your response but this whole thing because i think <laughs> i think i could ask like this is this is fascinating for me um and, and you the short answer and then we can and elaborate. maybe we can do a part two uh but for you um how do you okay so i'm i'm this is gonna uh, uh, there's two questions here for but for you how do you see uh trying to think of a, of a, of a um, do you look at God? Are you tempted to look at God and go, this is unfair? Um, or how do you practice seeing the grace of God? Do you look at this as this is an extra burden that I have that other people don't? Um, how do you convey that with people that are struggling or that disagree with you uh, on 
who can be sexually active. And, and, and while I'm saying that real quick, going back to that real quick, when you use the term gay, you are using that primarily referring to orientation, not practice. That's right. Right. That's, okay. I just wanted to make that. I, yeah, I, I had, I knew that picked up on that. Uh, but I also want to make that clarification for anybody else that may watch this. I think that's um, very helpful to understand. Uh, but in your own thoughts, uh, yeah, uh, how do you both wrestle with that internally, and um, uh, and then uh, convey that with others in times of counseling or encouragement, or even potentially debate? Yeah, I don't debate this topic. Uh, that's probably I, I good. Don't, I don't <laughs> think it's uh, appropriate for polemics. Um, okay. I think it's better to. Have honest conversations and not be trying to win arguments because for those of us who are just trying to figure out what God wants from us, that's a very sensitive um, thing. Absolutely. Because, because it, it, I mean, you can look and see your whole life trajectory going in very different directions, depending on where you, where you land on what the Bible is teaching. Um, and I, um, you know, I don't feel, I've, I've never really felt like this is unfair. Um, I mean, I believe that, you know, Adam was told the day you eat of the fruit of that tree, you will surely die. And spiritually he died, but he had a long stay of execution before physically dying. And that shrank through generations. But um, I look at it and I, as a child of, of Adam, what I deserve is to die and go to hell forever as an enemy of God who declared my independence against God in Adam, who was my representative just as surely as, you know, Thomas Jefferson was my, uh, you know, representative in 1776 declaring my independence. Um, and so I look at this life as a life of brokenness and betrayal and shame and sin and death with grace and glory breaking in. And, uh, and I'm just amazed by the grace and the glory, you know, I'm, I'm just amazed that like with, within God's wisdom, he chose the gay kid who grew up atheist to come to Jesus and be adopted. And that's amazing. Like, uh, that's why me, I didn't deserve it. Man. Uh, so yeah, I'm not one to talk about, cause I just go back to the foundations of biblical teaching and the biblical story and, and. I don't want the, I mean, Paul calls it the pride of life, of, of forgetting that, that we're dust and that mm -hmm. we're in a return to dust and that what we deserve is so different from what we've been given and that should humble us. And so, no, I don't feel like I've been treated unfairly. I, uh, I think there is loss involved that you have to be very honest about in pastoring people. Um, you know, when you think about, 16 year old young woman who's realized she is exclusively same sex attracted. And you want to think about what that might mean for her, uh, what weight she might carry. You know, think about the older lady that you've known who, in her 30s, she doesn't get married, in her 40s, she doesn't get married. And she's realizing by the time she's 65 that she's probably never going to get married. And you take all of the pain and that that, that 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 entails because she's being denied something for which her body was made and her soul uh, in the beginning. And you then think about the couple in your church that tried and tried to have kids and it, every, every avenue was a dead end and every hope was a false one and every lead was, didn't go anywhere. And, and as they're getting closer to 40 in their early 40s and they're realizing God's not going to give them a child of their own through in the way that they had hoped for all those years. And you take all that pain and suffering and you take the pain and suffering of that couple and that woman who doesn't marry and you throw all of that on a 16 year old girl at mm. once. That's a heavy thing. You know, um, when God puts someone who is same sex attracted in your church, he is gifting you someone who, if they follow Christ, is an amazing gift and a model of faithfulness. And, and, and that is somebody that um, God is gifting you in order to love them. 
can be family. And, uh, and, and some will say, I can't pay this price and they'll, they'll walk away and, uh, they, and they'll, they'll find these affirming arguments persuasive because emotionally they don't want to be alone and they're afraid of being alone. Um, the loneliness is, is a big thing. Um, you know, when people talk about same-sex attraction, homosexual orientation, being celibate and gay, oftentimes conservative Christians get fixated on sexual sin as if that's the issue. Um, and um, I've never held hands. I've never been sexually active. But when you're talking about an orientation, you're talking about something that's bigger than homoerotic temptation. There's the other side of that, which is the absence of attraction toward wife. Mm. And that's the much more costly part. Same sex attraction, no big deal. I deal with it the same way you deal with your opposite sex attraction. You look the other way, you try to clear your mind, you try not to save up that, that, that image for later retrieval. You have covenant eyes on your phone. You have an accountability partner who asks you questions. There are certain places you don't go, certain billboards you don't look at, certain pages and magazines you flip by really fast. You have certain things that you just, sexual purity is the same for all of us. Right. Uh, but the, the other side is the absence of sexual longing for a woman. And you can't call that indwelling sin. It's, you know, that's, that's the Bible tells us to look at uh, sis, as women as sisters and mothers with absolute purity. That's how Jesus viewed them. That's how I viewed them. Like, that's great. But, um, but the loss there of the companionship aspect is, is the larger weight that most folks like me feel. Hmm. Um, now, my church has been great, and there's a reason I've been in the same church for 27 years, because I, I would not go start over somewhere unless I had very clear direction from God, because I'd be losing my family. Um, be alone. Yeah. Yeah, that's, a, that's a, a powerful point. I mean, it, it, anybody growing up, I mean, even from a heterosexual viewpoint, you don't grow up and fantasize necessarily about a a wife that you're gonna have sex with, you do that. It is the companionship, um, uh, along with that, but not exclusively. Just the 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 uh, erotic view of love, and so with that, um, I think one of the things uh, that I have been challenged on, especially with revoice, uh, what is that? Is that four years? Is this the fourth year? 18 was the first year. Okay. So this um, year four, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, in in uh, a lot of reading and, and even some conversations with Nate some, and, and some other conversations, I think one of the things that have come up uh, out of that, a challenge to uh, the evangelical church at large, maybe the Protestant church at large, uh, that we have viewed love from almost a strictly uh position of romance yeah um and that is not that is that's incomplete at best uh and so uh we have neglected greatly because we've done sermon upon sermon upon sermon on sex on marriage on all those things uh but the missing the thing that we have not done sermons on is this very biblical view of friendship yeah. So, and, and you, yeah, um, and, and not even friendship, uh, not just friendship, but then also, and this probably adds a, a, an element to that, but what you just referred to, we talk about church family all the time, but for, for, for good, reformed, evangelical folk, when we say family, most of the time we're referring to biological. Um, can you give us a vision uh, what is what does the church need to hear about not only just friendship but also household? Uh, a view that that family goes beyond just even within the four walls goes beyond just uh, biological um, family. What is, what is no. yeah? Well, you know, when Jesus was teaching and his wife and his, his mother and brothers showed up and the disciples all said, Jesus, your, your, your mother and brothers are, are waiting for you. And, and in an honor and shame-based society, Jesus did the shameful thing. He did not, he was supposed to drop everything and go, go to his biological family. 
but he didn't. He said, who are my father and mother and brothers? Look around you, you who obey the will of my father in heaven. You are my father, my mother, my brothers. And what he did there is he redefined family as being the church first mm. and the body of Jesus first and your biological family second. And that's a very foreign concept to American Christians. And, and we have a poverty of spiritual experience because of it, because we're hunkered down with our own private family, trying to do private devotions and trying to do family devotions, all this kind of stuff. But, but it should be larger than that. Um, you know, one friend of mine, for example, who's celibate and, and gay, um, committed to following Jesus, he lives with a family that has pretty much adopted him. Yeah. Uh, he has his own private space and, 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 but, but they gather together for meals, they vacation together. Um, and I think this is important for single people in the church, whatever their sexual orientation. Yes. Um, and for widows in the church and for divorcees in the church, they, you know, practically who has refrigerator rights in your home? Who knows they can walk into your home and open the refrigerator without having to ask permission first? Yes. Who knows they can grab a beer or a soda and not have to get permission? Those are people who have become family to you because they mm. don't feel like they're guests in your house needing to ask permission. You've implied already, you're just one of us, just go do it. Yeah. Um, that's, that's a really beautiful thing when you get that. And you really want to aim to have multiple people who have refrigerator rights in your home. And uh, I think we probably need to spend a lot more time in each other's homes, in each other's lives, knowing each other um, in closer, more intimate contexts. Um, you know, I look at how a typical family schedules their week and typically there's so much pressure right now for youth sports and for clubs and gymnastics and Pilates and whatever else they're doing, you know, to, to kind of, build this resume that you can use to get into the college or school of your choice. Mm -hmm. And it's all geared toward that, making sure that your kid doesn't miss out on any experience. But um, what if you cut out 80% of that and instead spent time uh, camping with, enough, with some other Christians that you know, experiencing something where you're parenting each other's kids and you're encouraging each other's kids and you're going off on a walk with one of the other adults while the other take care of the kids and you know you just where yeah. you're experiencing life together um community together in a way that is going to be so much more rich than having all these things you can tick off and all these experiences that your kids have had um being present with people and loving them and being loved by them and being known by them. Um, you know, for, for single people, one of our biggest challenges is being known. I mean, how much sin can we get into because we want to be known? Uh, relationships that we can't break off, sexual sin, uh, you know, spending way too much time on social media trying to be known there and it doesn't work because it's all crafted. Um, but, you know, um, to have real heart to heart conversations. You know, for me, it looks like several different guys that I'm get together with every week over decades and, uh, and a family that I'm in their house all the time um, because that just, I have to be known. When you're married, you're kind of known like it or not, you know, <laughs> you, you, um, unless you're really doing it wrong, you know, uh, assuming you're letting her well, in. I was gonna say, uh, yeah, there's uh... <laughs> Some are Assuming you're letting some, her in. Some are found out, but yeah. Uh, but, um, but yeah, that's that challenge to be known. And the, the church has the proper context for that. Um, in the early, in the, in the Eastern Orthodox Church, they had something called uh, Adelphoi Poesis, which I don't advocate for, but it was a, a ceremony. It was never officially sanctioned by the church, but it was performed regularly called brother making, where a family could adopt another adult into their family. Hmm. It was sometimes done for business reasons uh, because it cemented business relationships, but it was done for other reasons as well. It was not done for romantic or sexual reasons, but um, in antiquity to be part of one's family uh, meant that you had mutual obligations and responsibilities. You know, if your brother and not just 
immediate family, extended family, you know, because that's another thing. White Americans think family, you think mom, dad, and two kids. All the rest of the world thinks family, and they think grandma and aunt and uncle and cousins yes. too. Yes. And uh, and and within that ancient family structure, if your cousin or if your brother was in jail, you had to bail them out. If they defaulted on a loan, you had to come up with money to pay it off. You know, if they did some, if they were exposed doing something shameful, you came to their defense publicly, then dragged them home and chewed them out in private. You know, it just it's it's because uh, you have mutual responsibilities and obligations. You're bound to one another. Yes. And and Jesus is saying that's what we have as the church. You know, if if there's somebody in your church who loses their job, everybody needs to get out their wallet and start finding out how to take care of this guy. Yeah. It's just crazy biblical view that I think in our very lonely cultural context really resonates with uh, and really draws non-Christians when they see it. Yeah. Yeah. Which, and, and that is uh, hard. I mean, even, even as I sit in my home and I look out at these four walls that just contain the nuclear family with a private bedroom that is, you know, that's big enough where my wife and I can both spread out in there. And it's not like, we just don't, uh, it, it is f a foreign concept to us to invite in, I mean, us culturally uh, beyond the nuclear family and how much we forfeit uh, by not doing that. And, and you're, you're, you know, when you talk about things getting interrupted, uh, I don't know if you were fully, there was a little pandemic about a year and a half ago that uh, interrupted every single sports schedule imaginable. And all of a sudden, we're left sitting around a room facing each other, <laughs> going, you know, going to have to have a conversation. Right. Right. Who are you? What are we, what, <laughs> you know, are you our kids? Um, and, uh, and we've, we've, we've always tried to be minimal on that, but man, when that hit, you know, I used to delight in canceled plans uh, on occasion, but now a year and a half later, I'm like, I'd love it for some plans to go through. <laughs> um <laughs> But uh, that is that's beautiful and uh, something for the church to continue to maybe maybe re grasp from, uh, you know, Western individualism and not just individual me and mine, but individual like familial us and ours. And yeah, as civilization reboots over the next year, uh, as all of these clubs and classes and sports and everything are, are getting back up and running, you know, you can do the Christian option and just step back from a lot of that and say, no, I would rather have this time to reboot relationships mm. with people now that vaccinations are around, now that, that, you know, numbers are flattening in this area and starting to go down, though we'll see what happens with the schools. But, you know, yeah. take these opportunities to say, hey, this is a time to actually start reaching out first to people in my own church family and maybe people who are different from me, people who aren't my age or my background or my family size, um, you know, and really build that, that biblical family of mutual obligation and love, you know? Yeah. You got an opportunity to start over. Yeah, no, that's true. That's very true. Um, I, again, there's probably another hundred things that I, in my mind that I'd love to ask. Uh, but, um, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, maybe put the brakes on here and, and maybe if you're up for it, maybe sometime in the, doing a future conversation. Um, I want to tell you, this was uh, not only your sermon, but uh, this conversation was tremendously helpful. Uh, I appreciate, I, I, I want, I want to tell you, um, Greg, and I've long thought this, but have not uh, expressed it to you personally, but I, I do believe that you are a gift to the church. Uh, and I am grateful for you, your testimony, your witness, um, that you are not bitter and jaded, uh, at least externally, uh, you, you either fake it well, or, uh, <laughs> that's that, which is, uh, which is amazing. Because sometimes I feel like I'm bitter and jaded on your behalf. Uh, so, um, and maybe that's carrying one another's burdens. Uh, maybe I can, maybe that's that. family obligation. Maybe it is. <laughs> maybe it is. Um, but, uh, Trent, I appreciate I you. love your church. Uh, it was so sweet to meet these folks and they were so encouraging. So tell them, thank you. That is fantastic. And uh, it's good to hear. And again, thanks for um, 
for being there on Sunday. And then thanks for doing this. And uh, I'm going to hit pause on the recording and then uh, we, we can say goodbye off of the recording. <laughs> Sounds good. All right.